Well, we have to start by saying hello, Rapid City. Hello. And thank you for that incredible South Dakota welcome. I have to tell you, you have to see outside. It's places packed. I wish the press were legit. They'd turn around, they'd show this arena. This arena is incredible. And you are incredible people. Incredible people. I'm thrilled to be back with thousands of hardworking, God-fearing patriots in the heartland of America. I want to thank one of the most successful governors in the entire nation, an incredible person, South Dakota's own, Christy Noam. Thank you, Christy. Okay. You already found this out, but Christy is a warrior for American values. She's tough on China, and unlike other Governor, she never locked down South Dakota. You know, they all say, oh, I kept it open, I kept it open. If they didn't keep it open, we had some good ones. I'll tell you what, uh, McMaster, South Carolina was great, and we had some really good ones, but uh, Christy was uh, just, uh, just incredible. Well, look at your numbers. You gotta look, you gotta look at those numbers. She does well. 10%. What, what state's gone up 10%? Tell me another one. Christy, I'm truly honored to receive your endorsement. Very much so. I appreciate it. Very Thank you, Christy. Thank you very much. It's, very, it's a great honor. I get endorsements, some good, some bad. I get endorsements, some don't mean anything. Hers means a lot, let me tell you. Everyone here tonight is part of the greatest political movement in the history of our country. This is the greatest movement. Look at this. This place is packed. We come to South, we come to South Dakota. I said, uh, how many people do you normally have at your Republican Party dinners and events? Oh, a couple of hundred. This is like six, seven thousand people. This is a lot. Your chairman is great. We'll talk about him in a second. He's done a fantastic job, but this broke your all-time record. And maybe we'll break it again next year. We'll have to do that. You know, maybe we'll break it. We're the only ones that can do it. But we're racing toward a monumental victory uh, one year from now. This is so important. There's never been anything like this one. This is, you know, when we did 2016, I said, this is the most important, and I meant it. But this is now, this is the most important election we've ever had, because our country is going to hell. It's going to hell. Together, we're going to defeat crooked Joe Biden, the most crooked president in history, the most incompetent president in history. We're going to take back the White House, and we're going to make America great again. So three years ago, I traveled to South Dakota to deliver a very historic address. It turned out people love that speech. They always say, oh, that was the best one. You know what? I think that beautiful, that beautiful facade. Is there a better place in the world to make a speech, Christy? I don't think so. Even though you do have the lunatics that would like to chop it up and knock it down, that's not happening. I wouldn't want to be them. Come to South Dakota. Let's do a little number in the — that is an incredible place. And it's some of the most beautiful pictures I've ever had taken of my family and all of us together. We had a tremendous crowd and uh, incredible. Then we opened it up for the fireworks, remember? And for a few years, you had the fireworks. And then the Democrats closed it down for the fireworks. I said, why would they do that? Well. How beautiful was that? But, but think of it, and they closed it down. They were worried about fire, but I said, it's all stone and rock. It's hard for rock to catch on fire. No, they just didn't want to do it, but Mount Rushmore is a very, very special place, incredible place. I stood before you at this majestic period of time and a majestic monument itself and fiercely defended our great American heroes from the Marxist and communist maniacs who were trying to blast them. They would have blast that incredible work right off the face of that very beautiful mountain. Yet today, under Joe Biden, the Marxist, fascists, and communists are not just tearing down statues. 
They're tearing down our economy. They're dismantling our borders. They're destroying our laws. They're looting our middle class, mutilating our children. They're mutilating our children. Who would imagine? Who would imagine that somebody would say that? And it's true. Desecrating our constitution and perverting our military. Our military is becoming woke. We defeated ISIS, and now it's becoming woke. Our White House is is just a place that's not recognizable. And our highly weaponized Department of Injustice. It's weaponized like never before. Nobody's ever seen anything like this. Under Crooked Joe, you know, I took the word out. I was Crooked Hillary, but now I've given her a different name because I don't like having the same name. For we have enough. We have enough words. We don't have to do so. I call her Beautiful Hillary. Beautiful. beautiful. That was a good day a few months ago. But I, when he did the indictment thing, it was him. You know, this is not an indictment. This is a Biden indictment. This is a big like Trump's under a No, no, this is a campaign thing that they're doing. But under Crooked Joe, I just thought it was such an appropriate name. All you have to do is take a little look at what's going on. Millions and millions of dollars have been stolen. But our country is being destroyed under this man. But tonight, I repeat to you what I said three years ago in the shadow of Mount Rushmore. The American people are strong. And we are proud, and we will not allow our country and all of its values, its incredible history and culture, to be, to be taken from us. They're trying to take it from us. You see it every day. You see what's going on with your vote in this election. Joe Biden's banana republic. We have turned into a banana republic. We have no borders. We have dishonest elections. We have things going on today. I mean, who wants to have millions of people like an invasion pouring into our country. We have no idea where they come from. They come from jails, and they come from places that you don't want to know about. And they're all over our cities, and they're all over our states. But with your vote in this election, Joe Biden's country, for a short period of time, hopefully just a short period of time, it ends on November 5th, 2024. We have to take care. We have to take our country back. We have to take our country back. America will be saved, and the great nation of Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, and Roosevelt. They don't want to mention those names, you know. It'll be restored. We will restore our nation. It's never been this low. It's never been this low. If you took the five worst presidents in the history of the United States and added them up, they would not have done near the destruction to our country as Joe Biden and the Biden administration have done in a few short years. Nobody can imagine. Nobody can imagine. And no damage has been worse than the disaster known as Bidenomics. You know, he was given that term as a negative. And he liked the way it sounded, so he tried to turn it, because they're all about disinformation and misinformation. You know, one thing with Christie, she tells it like it is. It's right down. There's no disinformation. Sometimes you may be better off doing it that way. It's easier, isn't it, huh, than having to really produce. But they're a party of disinformation. And so he tried to turn Bidenomics into a good thing. It's not a good thing. It's a real bad thing. It was meant very bad, but he liked the sound of the name. You know, he doesn't know too much about what's going on anymore, but he thought it was good. Since Joe Biden took office, cumulative inflation has reached almost 20 percent. Think of that. Think of it. Over a two-and-a-half-year period, now we're getting up. Can you imagine? Just a little more than a year, and we can rid ourselves of what's happened to this country. We can bring our country back. And the dollar has lost more than 20 percent of its value in just three years' time. Think of it. It's not even possible. It never happened before. These are records we're talking about, all records, all very negative records. Joe Biden has blown through. $11.5 trillion in wasteful spending, spending that should have never happened, equivalent to $88,000 taken away from every family in America. 88000 from every family. Under Biden, the budget deficit is exploding and set to more than double this year alone. You know, we were doing something with oil and energy and making a lot of money. We were going to make so much money. We were going to pay off our debt. We were going to lower taxes still further. Manufacturing has contracted 
Now, 10 months in a row and monthly job reports have been revised downward every single month of 2023. Every single month they've gone down. The fact is we're probably heading into a Great Depression, something I've never said before publicly. I'm saying it in your state. I hate to, I hate to say that this is the state I have to say it, but you know, I don't believe I've ever said that before. It's a hell of a statement to make, and I hate to make it. The only question is whether or not it'll be during the remaining months of the Biden administration. If it's going to happen, let it happen then. If it's going to happen, let it be during, Joe, and we'll come in and we'll straighten this sucker out. I'd rather have it. Or will the next president have to bear the brunt of what Biden has done to our country? He's done such damage to our country. And I don't want to be the next Herbert Hoover. You know who Herbert Hoover was, right? The Great Depression. He was the president during the beginning of the Great Depression. But I won't let that happen. I will never let that happen. That I can tell you. During Biden's first 30 months in office, just 2.1 million new jobs have been created nationwide. Now, they have a different wrinkle on it. And uh, the wrinkle is so off that even the fake news back there said that he can't get away with that. <laughs> now, he makes up these stories, you know, like there's a picture of a fighter jet. I used to be a fighter jet pilot. Then there's a picture of a truck. I used to drive a truck. And there's a picture. There's everything. This guy. The worst is, did you ever see his golf swing? He said he's a six handicap. Six handicaps, a good golfer. You know when he's six handicaps, that's a good golfer. This guy can't hit a ball to Christie. He's a six handicap. I think that's the greatest lie of all, if you want to know the truth. By contrast, during the first 30 months of President Trump, we created 4.9 million new jobs, shattering all predictions and projections. Nobody's ever seen any of that. It's the greatest economy in history. Greatest in history. Under Biden, real incomes have gone down by $7,400 per family. Think of that. Under President Trump, yearly income went up by, no, by more than $6,000. That's a record, more than $6,000. Think of that. And all of this horror, and yet Joe Biden is traveling around the country pretending he's an economic genius. In fact, He's actually an economic arsonist, and Biden omics is incinerating American wealth at a level never seen before. It's an inferno of inflation, taxation, submission, and failure. We submit. Everyone says, what is submission? You're submitting to China. You're submitting to all these countries. We're pouring money out of our country. We can't take care of our own country. We can't help Hawaii. But we send billions and billions and billions of dollars to other countries. The choice, the choice in this election is between a Biden economic bust, and it's going to happen, and it's going to be ugly, or a Trump economic boom. We had it booming like never before. This was the most successful economy in world history. We had the most successful. Everybody was happy. African Americans, Asian Americans, Hispanic Americans, men, women, people with degrees from the Great Wharton School of Finance, from Harvard, from MIT, people with no degrees at all. Everybody had jobs. Everybody was happy. Now you're given phony numbers because far fewer people are looking for jobs. So they throw around, although it just went up, but they throw around 3.5, 3.6, 3.7 percent. But it's a different group of people. They're looking for jobs, but many of them aren't looking for jobs. So it's a fake number. Crooked Joe cares only about enriching his own family. I care about enriching your family. And something that, again, I'm, this is like a, a, an evening of firsts, but something which uh, I proudly state that I'm the only president that ever lost money while serving in office, and I knew that would happen. I didn't know it was going to be that much. That's a lot. I lost a lot of number of billions. 
But I knew it was part of the game, and that's what I intended. I didn't intend. I could have made a fortune. Oh, I could have gone to these countries and made deals. You know, I put things in trust. I said, my kids are going to run it. I said, don't do deals outside of the country. Don't do this. Don't. They were going, Dad, can we do something? He said, no, you know, I'm president. We have a higher standard. And then I come out and I watch this Biden stuff with make, they go to make deals with countries that it's just the craziest thing I've ever seen. And I got to give credit to Jim Jordan and Jamie Comer and all of these guys because they found things that nobody thought could be found. But it cost me billions of dollars and it's been worth every single penny of it. Because I'm working for you, I'm not working for me. That I can tell you. Uh, I could have made so much, I could have made. Sir, we'd love to do a deal in Saudi Arabia. Sir, we'd love to do a deal here and there. We'd love to do a deal. I really can't do that, I'm president. Biden would do it. So we just, uh, I, we did it right. We did the right thing. And I do it exactly that way again. I will do it way, that way again. Look, we have a very short period of time. I do it that way again. I even gave away my salary. Does anybody say that I gave away my salary? No. They used to call every month, uh, did you give it away this month to people? Yeah. And you know, you have to give it to various uh, agencies, actually. Did you give it away? If I ever said no, it would have been, but when I say yes, yes, we did, yes, we did, I, I never read anything about it. If we would have said no, we didn't, there would be headlines, headlines. But it was an honor, it was all an honor. And if you want the Bidens to make millions selling out America to China, Russia, Ukraine, while your savings go up in flames and that's what's happened, how are your 401ks doing, you know, as an example? Then vote for Crooked Joe. He's Crooked Joe. You know, we used to call him Sleepy Joe, but I think Crooked Joe is a better name. Crooked Sleepy, Sleepy Crooked. No, I think it's better. It's more appropriate. If you want better jobs, higher wages, an affordable American dream, then you must vote for your favorite president, Donald J. Trump. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I wish those cameras would turn around. You know, you know you've heard me say this. It's very seldom. I go to arenas, and we sell out these arenas, and they're great. But I wish the cameras would show it. I wish they'd show it. It would actually be good for their ratings. It's a positive, not a negative. You know, when I first started, we, we started in actually 2015, and it would go into an arena, it would be packed, and everybody was enthusiastic. By the way, never have we had the enthusiasm that we have now, never. We've never had this enthusiasm. And we had record enthusiasm in 2016. In 2020, we had more. We had, we did better in 2020 than we did in 2016. Got millions and millions more. But, We've never had the enthusiasm that we have now. But I used to say early on, I'd say, you know, it's a shame. I'd go home and our great first lady would say to me, uh, how are you, darling? I said, could I ask you, did you watch the speech? Yes. And she's tough, you know. I'd say, how did I do? Well, I didn't like your hair. Oh. <laughs> I didn't like the way your hair looked. I said, oh, that's not good. But I said, how did the crowd look? Well, you couldn't tell except for the noise, you know, the noise. It was, it's obviously not 200 people shouting. Remember, Joey couldn't fill up the eight circles, and then he supposedly won. The fake news would used to have to come. They'd come down and they'd fill in those eight circles. But I'd say, uh, how do you like the crowd? Well, they'd never show the crowd, but I could tell it was a very big crowd by the, by the, you know, it's like, uh, it's like your great football team. It's like, well, you can tell. 
she could tell. <laughs> good. Now I'm going to get a good review tonight. That's good. But you know what? She could tell it was big, but she said, no, they never show the crowd. And I figured that it's maybe the structure of the camera. You know, it's on steel, tripods, and maybe you just can't turn it. And then we had a couple of embarrassing moments where people ended up fighting in a corner or something. And that camera turned around like a pretzel. They want to show that. So, so that was my theory. It couldn't do it because structurally, you know, it's very stiff and you can't turn it. But boy, when those guys started fighting in the corner, which was a bad thing, when they started fighting in the corner, I have never seen a camera like that. They got every angle. So I realized that wasn't working. But they won't show. I would love it if the press would turn around the cameras and show this incredible. They don't do it. They don't do it. Did you see that? They don't do it. They won't. They won't do it because they're told not to do it. Because they want to make it look — they don't want to show crowds like this because nobody has ever gotten crowds like this. Nobody's ever gotten — it's not me, it's all of us. It's our — this is our movement. This isn't my movement. We're sick and tired of what's happened to our country. But they won't do it, even though it's sort of good for them. You know, you show something that's so vibrant. Look at all the people standing over here. The, the, it's just, it's incredible. They just won't do it. I just said something. Would you please, I asked nicely, would you please turn around? You guys go crazy. Everybody up in the back, they're going crazy. Everyone's going crazy. Those cameras, I didn't see one of them even make a, a make an effort to turn around. That's why they call it fake news. That's why they call it fake news. You know, I'm proud of a lot of things. You don't mind if I go off the teleprompter for a second, do you? Better than I thought. <laughs> now. We like when we go off the teleprompter, don't you agree? Remember at the beginning, I used to do it without teleprompters. I didn't know what to tell. I said teleprompter. But you have to, because when you go on the teleprompter too long, no matter how good you are, it's called the boring time. Boring. <laughs> but uh, we've had an incredible, uh, an incredible time with this country. We have such potential. And you know, we speak so negatively, and it's so horrible to be telling you what happened, but you know what happened just like all you have to do is watch the newscast, which, by the way, if you look at ABC, CBS, NBC, you look at CNN, you look at MSDNC, which is, I think, the worst of all. I think they're horrible. Uh, I mean, the, what they say, they're evil. They're evil. They're really evil. And they're really a wing of the Democrat Party. I mean, they should be paying. Somebody should report that for campaign contributions because it's so bad. What they say is so, so nasty, so horrible. You know, you don't want your family to watch it. How about me? I hear I'm going to be indicted. I said, indicted? I never learned about that at the Wharton School. Indicted? You're going to be indicted. How about me? I have to go see my wife. Darling, uh, may I talk to you for a moment? Yes. I'm going to be indicted for no reason whatsoever on Friday. And then that happens. 
Oh, it's traumatic. You call your daughters, you call your sons, and you say this, and you know, it's a terrible thing. And then I hear a couple of weeks later, I'm going to be indicted for something else, then for something else, then for something else. And now they're saying, don't indict him anymore because they lost credibility. <laughs> but how about that? You go four times to tell your kids, and even the lawsuits, it's all inspired. All inspired. No, these are sick people. These are people that are actually sick. I mean, and they're, they're just destroying our country. And if we don't take it back, if we don't take it back in 24, I really believe we're not going to have a country left. There's not going to be anything left. And you see it less because, you know, you're here in this great state. And I heard Christy use that term, fly over. But it's fly over and everybody admires you when they're looking down. They'd like to be here with you because they know what's happening on the West Coast and they know what's happening on the East Coast. And it's not, and it's not pretty. So the people that are smart, they say, there's no more flyover. We're coming right here to South Dakota or other places. I mean, you don't see what's going on other than the news, and the news really covers it up. They don't show the main networks. They don't show what's going on on the border. It's, it's peanuts. What they show is nothing compared to the facts. This is an invasion and a destruction of our country, and they don't want to show it because they want that crooked guy to be reelected if he makes it to the starting gate. I don't know if he's good. <laughs> and you know, I used to treat him with a modicum of respect because I have respect for the office of the presidency, and I would never talk the way I talk now. But when they indicted me for nothing, for nothing, for free speech, I said the election was rigged and stolen, which it was, and everybody knows that. Everybody knows it. Free speech. And, but I used to say, and you know, we're political opponents, but he actually did this to an opponent, a political opponent. Nobody would ever think it's possible. It wasn't really possible, even psychologically possible. He did this to an opponent. But when you think about it, I never said bad stuff. Now I say he's the worst president in the history of our country. He's the most corrupt president in the history of our country. And as other foreign leaders say, and as I say, he is grossly incompetent and he's very dangerous because he has no idea what he's doing. He can't put two sentences together. And we're playing with nuclear weapons with other countries, and he has no clue what the hell is going on. So I would never have said that out of respect for the office. Not for him, but for the office. But now that they've weaponized the Department of Justice, uh, now that it's been weaponized, now that the FBI came out with you saw that with Twitter. They call it Twitter files. And the things they've done are so bad. They're so evil. With all of the different things that have taken place and with all of the corruption that you're witnessing on a nightly basis, and you don't have to watch. The great thing about the internet, a lot of it's really bad, but you get a lot of, you get to see what's happening. You really do get to see what's happening. But when you see the kind of things, I feel I'm totally free to speak my mind. And my mind is the same as your mind, because you know what's happening just like I do. But we will, because they won't, because they don't care about South Dakota, that I can tell you. But we will stand up for South Dakota workers, and we will stand up for South Dakota farmers. I have, nobody's ever taken care of the farmers like, like President Trump. As your president, I took on communist China like no administration in history, bringing hundreds of billions of dollars, as you know, pouring into our treasury, hundreds of billions. They didn't like me too much. Actually, I think I got along very well with them, considering what we were doing, but what we were doing was fair. When no other president had ever gotten literally 10 cents, they never had 10 cents. We got hundreds of billions. I gave our farmers, out of the money that we got, $28 billion. That's why I say your state, Iowa. I'm going to Iowa tomorrow. I said somebody, and I, I don't like to say it too often because I don't believe in doing that or I knock on wood. I have a lot of wood. This is a real wood. A lot of these things are plastic. This is the real deal. But you know, I don't like saying things like nobody else could do this, nobody else. But 
Nobody else could have gotten you 28 billion for your farmers. And I said to the people of Iowa, I said to the people of Nebraska, we're represented very well, Charles. I said, we can't possibly lose, because I got the farmers $28 billion from China. Nobody else would even think about it. Nobody else would think about it. And I'll just tell you, you know, a guy who was very disloyal because I got him elected, so I call him Ron DeSanctimonious. He strongly opposed my protection for our farmers. I protected our farmers very simply. And by the way, those farmers got big checks. Any farmers in here got big checks? Yes? Yes. Oh, he's happy. But that goes to the people, that goes to the workers, it goes to everybody. But we had 28 billion. I said, nobody else is going to be able to do that. I said, there's no way I'm going to lose farm states. But very simply, De Sanctis sided with the communists in China, and he fought very hard that this not take place. He also opposed Medicare, and he opposed a thing called Social Security. Remember this about a politician. Their first idea is always what they go back to. So now I'm sure he's changed. I don't know. I don't watch him. He's gone so low in the polls, I'm not really watching him. <laughs> they say, sir, forget about him. He's gone. I say, no, nobody's gone. Nobody's gone until it's over, right? It ain't over till it's over, Yogi, the great Yogi Berra, a great philosopher. <laughs> but the sanctimony has voted to get Social Security. Think of it. Social Security three times voted. Hands up, voted. He is a disciple of Paul Ryan, the great Paul Ryan. You know who Paul Ryan is? Was it good? And he wanted to raise, and he will raise if he ever got in here, which I don't think is going to happen, not even in four years. But he wanted to raise the minimum age to 70. That's a big deal. He also wanted to hit Medicare and hit it very, very hard. I ended the NAFTA disaster, the worst trade deal ever made in the history of our country and replaced it with the brand-new USMCA that's Mexico-Canada. They say it's the best trade deal ever made in the history of our country. I actually think, I may be wrong, you know, I made a deal with China, but I don't talk about it because once COVID came in, I said, I'm not even talking about it. But the deal I made with China is $50 billion they buy a year. You know, it started out at four or three. And then we got them up to 15. And then I went into the negotiating room and I said, listen, you're so big, we want 50 billion. And they said, okay, 50 billion. And I said, do you remember the farmers remember this? I said, here's what you do. Because the farmers went along with me. You know, it took us a year and a half to get that done because they're not easy to deal with. They're great negotiators. They were ripping off our country. They couldn't believe this was happening because usually they'd, you see the way they go now and they bow to the Chinese, they bow. They have no respect. They get no respect whatsoever. But I said, it's going to take a little long to do this. And I'll never forget, 32 farmers came to see me at the White House. Beautiful everything, or beautiful room, all set up. And I said, I'm going to get you a lot of subsidy from China. And one of the farmers raised his hand. I'll never forget, this is the only time this happens. Sir, we don't want subsidy. We just want a fair, level playing field. I couldn't believe it. It's the first time that's ever happened. Because everybody else, Christie says, we want the money. We want money. The farmers didn't. They just wanted a level playing field, which they didn't have. And I went to Sonny Perdue, who was the Secretary of Agriculture. I said, Sonny, what damage have they done over the last three, four, five years to our farmers? And he comes back two days later. He said, sir, it's about $28 billion. I said, it's a lot. I said, uh, we're going to get it. And I got the $28 billion, and farmers picked up big, fat, beautiful checks. And I was very happy to do it. And I said, there's no way I lose a farm. How the hell am I going to lose a farm state? Any farmer voted against me. I can't imagine that. So I was a little bit cockier than I should be. But now I will knock on wood, just in case. But I don't see how we can lose with the farmers and with the manufacturers. Same thing. But they buy $50 billion. Now what I understand is, you know, you have to police that. You have to make sure. I used to go in once every week. Are they buying? Yes, sir, they started. Are they buying? Every week, I'd say, are they buying? They didn't, I didn't have to say China. Yes, sir, they are. They're buying. I bet you right now, if you look, I'll bet they're not buying anything. I'll bet they're not buying at all. And the way they push our country around, it's incredible. There's no reason for it. We had a very strong relationship, but it was a good relationship, and we did fantastically well. But that 
that deal might have been better than the USMCA, but the USMCA in Mexico, Canada was a very one-sided deal. That NAFTA was so one-sided. I had to say, I said, we have to change it. You know, they made some typos in the original deal many years ago. They were typos of numbers, where the typos were actually much more for them. And they didn't change it. They never even called it. You know, you have a thing called, you call up and you say, by the way, we made some mistakes. They didn't bother changing it. Those, that deal was so bad, NAFTA, for us. And now uh, the USMCA is so good, they want to renegotiate the deal. They called up the Biden administration. This deal's not fair. And I hope they don't do it, because uh, they shouldn't do it. It's a great deal for us. But I think maybe the China deal might even be better. But we made a lot of them. We made deals with Japan, because they were really ripping us big. We made deals with South Korea. You know what they were doing. Everybody, there wasn't any good deal. I said, who made all these deals? We did many, many things, and we made our country successful. We made people in manufacturing successful. We stopped them from dumping steel. We saved our steel mills. It's been, uh, it's been just, it's been such a great honor to do it. And it was sort of easy. You know, Prime Minister Abe of Japan, who was, as you know, assassinated, a great guy who's a friend of mine, I went to him, I said, listen, Shinzo, uh, this is so unfair, the deal that you have with America. Oh, is it really? Oh. I said, no, no, it's really unfair. I said, we got to redo it. He says, I knew you'd come to me. No other president came to him. He said, I knew you'd come to me, because he understood. He understood how unfair it was. South Korea, the same thing, sort of. Uh, they knew it was so unfair. I said to South Korea, we have to renegotiate the deal. We have 35,000 troops there in harm's way because you have North Korea, but I got along very well with Kim Jong-un. If I weren't elected president, you would have had a nuclear war guaranteed. If Hillary Clinton went in or Obama, Obama in some form, maybe the form would be Biden, was you would have ended up in a nuclear war. We got along after the first month or two when it was rather tough, you remember? Little Rocket Man and... He said, I have a red button on my desk. And I said, I have a red button, too. Mine's bigger, better, and mine works a lot stronger than you. And President Obama told me when we sat down, it's a sort of a ritual before you take office, I sat down. I said, so what's the biggest problem? He said, biggest problem is North Korea. I mean, he really felt we were going to end up in a nuclear war. I said, have you called them? You know, rather than losing millions of people. Have you called them? And uh, he didn't say yes. And I said, well, maybe somebody should have to call. And, and the truth is that uh, they did call, and they were not received well. When we spoke and we dealt, I went over there. You remember that? It was a very historic moment. <laughs> went over there. And I said to Kim Jong-un, you know, being a real estate guy, it's just sort of natural. I said, you have the most beautiful shoreline. Think of it. You're between China, Russia, and South Korea. Look at the beautiful shore. You could have the most beautiful condos that you've ever seen and become rich as hell. You don't have to live like you're living. But he's a tough guy. He's a smart guy. And uh, he just loves collecting nuclear weapons. That's what he does. He collects nuclear weapons. And, and uh, we got along incredibly well once we met and once we started the whole thing. And we saved the Olympics in South Korea because nobody was going. Nobody wanted to be blown out of the stadium. And we came along. They actually participated in the Olympics. We had a great, we had a great relationship, and it would have been great. We would have had a deal done long ago if the election weren't rigged. And uh, that's the way it is. I mean, it's a shame. Think of what's happened to our country. In just three years, think of what's happened to our country. You look at the borders and you look at we're not respected. We're left at all over the world. We're losing all of these countries. Saudi Arabia now is aligned with China. We don't want them aligned with China. They're very good. They have tremendous oil reserves, but we really don't need their oil reserves. You know, we have more oil under our feet. I called it liquid gold than Saudi Arabia or than Russia. And you know what we do? We get it from Venezuela. They won't take it. We take their tar. You know, they don't have good oil. They have tar. And you know where we process it? In Houston. So all that stuff, if you're a believer in that, and I believe it to a certain extent, not like the maniacs that want to destroy our country, but it all goes up into the atmosphere. 
And uh, when China is very dirty, it all blows over here, just like you ever see in the Pacific Ocean. We're taking tons and tons and tons of garbage because China dumps their garbage in the Pacific, and the tide flows it in toward Los Angeles. We're, we're picking up their garbage. And then, the, then they say, we have to keep our claim. No, they have to participate because it blows over in three to four days. So what good does it do for us? to destroy our businesses by putting controls all over the place. By having, well, we had a trucker. I saw him over here someplace, a father and a son. I said, I read last night where they want to make all of these big trucks that travel all over the country. They want to make them all electric. It doesn't seem to make sense to me. He said, it will destroy the industry because they go for two hours and then you have to charge them for four hours, right? He was saying it doesn't work, and they put it on, they don't even talk. You gotta talk to the people. You gotta talk to the people in the trucking industry, not to some person that wants to destroy our country. I actually believe that's what they wanna do, but unlike the establishment globalists in this race, and they are globalists, I've also been an unwavering defender of ethanol, which you like right here, on behalf of the American farmers, and remain the ethanol champion, now keep it, it's a big factor in Iowa, your state, it's a big, big factor. Our record on the economy is unmatched in the history of our country. So it's no wonder we're up very big in the polls, leading all Republicans in the primary by massive numbers and crushing crooked Joe Biden in the general election. The new poll that came out just today, Remember, I used to go over the polls in the old days. I'd go over the polls, only if they were good. If they were bad, I wouldn't go over them. If I had a bad period and the polls weren't looking good, I wouldn't talk about them. If they're good, i talk. But I'll tell you, I'll talk now because these are the best polls. In the new premise poll that just came out last night, we're at 62 percent. De Sanctus is second to 12 percent. But he's sinking rapidly. So we're at 62. He's at 12. Uh, he's not doing a great job. And uh, the rest of the people are in single digits. You know, uh, we have a couple of them that are at zero. I wonder, what's this guy from Arkansas? What's, I love Arkansas. This guy, Hutchinson, Ada. I call him Ada Hutchinson. What the hell is he doing? He's at zero. He's been working so hard. He's a nasty guy, actually, but he's been working so hard. He's at zero. Does he think he can win? He's not going to be picked for a cabinet post, if that's what he's thinking about. But in the Redfield-Wilton poll, where it just came out a few hours ago, we're at 65 percent. De Sanctus is at 9 percent. That's now we're in. Now we're in the big You know, when we started, when I announced, we were up 20, 25 points. That's a lot. Now we're up 50, 60, 70 points. And then they say, why aren't you doing the debate? I say, wait a minute. If I do the debate, what am I doing? I have a guy at zero, one, two, asking me nasty questions, somewhat of a hostile network asking me nasty questions, right? What am I doing? Why am I doing it? And, you know, you want to have a smart president, not a stupid president, right? What I do look forward to, what I do look forward to is debating the Democrat, whoever that may be. And again, it's going to be interesting to see, because I don't think he makes it to the starting gate, but maybe he does. But it's going to be a very interesting period of time. And in the just-released uh, Iowa State poll, big deal. You know, Iowa is a very big deal. I kept them first in the nation. They very much appreciate it. They didn't do that. The Democrats didn't do that. But in the Iowa poll, just came out, I'm up 37 points, 51 to 14 on I don't even know if De Sanctus is second anymore. He's heading bad. He's turned out to be an unskilled politician. When asked by Morning Consult, which is a big deal, who has the best chance of defeating crooked Joe Biden in November, it was Trump at 63 percent, De Sanctimonious at 13 percent. So that's good. And Christy and her incredible, by the way, he's an incredible guy. Her husband is an incredible guy. And I appreciate you putting up with everything in the world of politics. It's, uh, I don't know, how the hell you do it? <laughs> incredible guy, wonderful guy. But we're, uh, we're doing well, and she's doing so well. I looked at your polls. I'm, I'm not going to talk about it, because 
I think you might be beating me in, in the state. And that's unacceptable. Usually I come in. It's unacceptable, Christy, to have that happen. But we're leading Biden in an electoral landslide by 5 points, 6 points, 11 points, 7 points, and various other polls. A couple haven't won. You know, as a Republican, when you lead a Democrat in a presidential race by two or three points, it means you're way ahead. But it's sort of different, because the polls are very skewed, it's called. But people that don't know politics, one poll came out last week, I'm leading by three. And a friend of mine said, how the hell can you only be leading by three, this guy? He, he can't speak. And I said, that's the world of politics. But and we have to be so careful. We have to make sure that they don't cheat because they are cheaters. And that's the biggest fear that we all have. It's the biggest fear. Biggest fear that everybody has. Our momentum is unprecedented and hopefully unstoppable. And that's the reason that Joe Biden's ordered his leading opponent arrested on 91 fake and phony charges. 91. How many charges are there? But we're going to ask for dismissals of a lot of it. Most of it is just, you ask for dismissal. It's called dismiss the charges. But remember, it's a, it's a Democrat charging his opponent. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. That means that if I win, and somebody wants to run against me. I call my attorney general. I say, listen, indict him. <laughs> well, he hasn't done anything wrong that we know of. I don't know. Indict him on income tax evasion. You'll figure it out. And you know, the good thing with me is I have a big voice, and people know me. And you know me for a long time. But people know me, and I'm able to speak. But if you're a regular politician, a really good politician, an honest politician, and you get indicted, you get a subpoena, and that gets reported in the paper and the news, you have to leave office. And the Republicans in the Senate and the Republicans in the House cannot let this go on because people are being destroyed. Lives are being destroyed by these sick lunatics in Washington. And I think I can honestly say this, Christy. I'm the only person in the history of politics that's been indicted whose poll numbers went up 25 points or something. Right? I think so. You know, usually if you get indicted, it's standard. I've watched it for years. Um, I'd like to announce my retirement. I'm going home to spend more time with my family and to fight these charges. You know, there's nothing you can do. But fortunately, I have a big voice, and people know, for better or worse, you know what the hell you're getting, right? But you're getting somebody that loves you and that's going to fight for you. That I can tell you. But you're witnessing the most corrupt and blatant weaponization of law enforcement our country has ever seen, and they're doing it for a single reason, election interference. Because with these indictments comes bad publicity. Now, the, my case is unusual, but maybe at some point that switches. You know, you go with these people and they're sick and they say this and that and that, and you have to prove. But it's incredible. But if you take a look at what they do to the publicity of a person, and I know numerous people over the years that I've really thought were honest in many cases, and they were literally out of politics in, in a matter of hours. Some of them literally quit immediately upon getting served with a subpoena. That won't happen with me. So we did. Thank you. By the way, and I, I say this more to the country than to this great state, because we have some states that are very close. This is not close. What did I win by this state, Christy? Like, a lot. 28 points or something. So you're very forgiving, right? No, but, but you have others where it's closer, and, and you've got to be very careful. But uh, you have to get out, and you have to fight like hell, because these are dirty players. And what we have to do is we have to take back our country. We have to straighten that whole situation out. And it does. It allows me to now, because this is unthinkable, I'm president, and I call my attorney general. Indict my opponent. He's doing well. I'm leading Biden in all these polls. Every time I have a good poll, 
It seems every time I have a, they give me another indictment. What's this one for? But if you're the president, you're the chief law enforcement officer of the country. You remember the fake uh, impeachments. We had impeachment hoax number one and impeachment hoax number two. They were two fake impeachments. One was over a phone call that turned out to be exactly right. Exactly right. But what you do is you make it impossible for people to win an election. It's called election interference at a level never seen before, and we have to stop it. But if they're allowed, what will happen, whether it's me or anybody else, if they're allowed to do it, that means that the Republicans are allowed to do it. And then you get into this situation which is really very bad and very dangerous for our country. Nobody thought a thing like this could happen. We did great in 2016, and we won. We did much better in 2020 than we did in 2016, getting many millions more votes. And we're going to do even better than we've ever done before in 2024. I feel that. I mean, I see it. Don't forget, you look at this arena, and it's packed. Look at this arena. It's packed. We're a year before the election. You know, these guys don't pack an arena the night before the election. They have a smattering of people. Oh, good luck. Remember Hillary with the uh, thing with the women screaming? That one, one woman with the glasses, she's become famous. No, no. That was the most beautiful stage I've ever seen. By the end of the evening, it didn't look pretty. It didn't look pretty. They rigged the presidential election 2020, and we're not going to allow them to rig the presidential election of 2023. Okay. Okay. We won't have a country. We won't have a country. Every time the radical left Democrats, Marxists, communists, and fascists indict me, I consider it a great badge of honor. I do. And I'm being indicted for you. I am being indicted for you. I'm not too thrilled about that, but that's part of the job description, isn't it? I'm being indicted for you. This battle is for every patriotic America who Joe Biden and the radical left has spied on. Look at what they did. They spied on my campaign, and we caught them. Let's see what all happens. We had a great report come out. Durham was a great report, just took too long, took so long. And we had uh, the IG Horowitz, he did a fantastic job, he did a fantastic, by the way, appointed by Democrats, uh, he did a fantastic job. We caught him, they spied on my campaign, think of, think of what would happen if I spied on, let's say, Obama's campaign, or even Biden's campaign, I wouldn't want to, it would be too boring, but let's see. <laughs> Although you'd see things that were very bad but censured and persecuted or slandered as a, it's really a threat to democracy while they trample our rights and liberties every single day of the year. You see it, you just turn it on and you see what they're doing. It's a horrible thing. It's for the blue collar workers, the waiters, the waitresses who Biden is harassing with 87,000 new IRS agents that are allowed to carry guns, by the way. You know, they don't want guns, but they're allowed to carry guns. They're allowed to carry guns. While the Biden crime family cheats on their taxes as they take in millions and millions of dollars in bribes from all over the world. I mean, the whole thing is incredible. Joe Biden is a Manchurian candidate. You know what that is, right? He's totally controlled by China and other countries that paid him off. And he's petrified of them because they know the real numbers. Jamie Comer, Jim Jordan, they would not have to wait very long. They could give him a list where the money came from, how much. And that's why I think he's acting so weak with so many countries. It's for the pro-life Christians and others who Joe Biden has thrown into jail, facing 10, 15, and even 20 years in prison for protesting and free speech, while Antifa and other groups burn down cities, kill people, go free, and don't even, in many cases, get prosecuted. So this battle, that we're in is a battle for all of us, and it's for history. This is historic. This is a big moment in our country, because we're either going to go one way or the other. And if we go the other, we're not going to have a country left. We will fight together. We will win together. And then we will seek justice together. We're going to seek justice together.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Never forget our enemies want to stop us because we are the only ones who can stop them. They want to take away my freedom because I will never let them take away your freedom. I'd rather have it be me. I'd rather have it be me. A friend of mine, very smart, very tough, he said, President, could I ask you a question? What? How do you take it? Every day you get another indictment. You never had anything like this. I said, no, I didn't. I said, uh, I don't know. You just have to take it. I'm doing it for a lot of great people. And I said, second of all, do I have a choice? Do I have a choice? I don't think so, right? Because we have to do it. We did the greatest job ever, and now we have to finish it off. We're going to finish it off. We're going to do a job like we can make this country number one. Right now, we're a laughed at bunch of fools. The world thinks we're a bunch of stupid fools because we're led by a man who should never, ever have been allowed to be been in that position. He's in a position that he should have never been allowed to have. We're listening here to former President Trump uh, make remarks, a speech over there in South Dakota to voters, uh, a packed house tonight. Some of you will be seeing a two-minute break, but don't go anywhere. We will continue with this live event when we come back. Their reign will be over, and America will be a free nation once again. We're not a free nation. We're, we're a terrible, I don't think there's ever been a darkness around our nation like there is right now. I mean, you take a look at Afghanistan, that horrible moment in history. I was with a lot of the families the other night at one of my places, and uh, they're incredible people. They'll never be the same. They're never going to be the same. That was so unnecessary, the way, we, the way we got out. I was the one getting us. I think we would have been out sooner. We would have been out with dignity and strength. You don't take the soldiers out first. You take the soldiers out last. Took the soldiers out. The rest was a field day for these people. And they would have never done that. You know, we didn't lose one soldier in 18 months. Not one soldier. Not one soldier. And Biden actually, in his speech, admitted that, and they gave him hell. Don't say that. That's a good thing about Trump. No, we didn't lose one soldier in 18 months. Think of it, over in Afghanistan with the Taliban. And uh, it's so sad to see. I was with these people. They're great people. They, sh they show me pictures of their sons, daughters. One came up, sir, you had to know my son. He was so good at football. He was a quarterback, sir. He could throw the ball. There's a mother. He could throw the ball so far. Could I tell you about a game that was played? You know, we have a rival. It's a local school, and they were very tough. And my son threw the ball, and he kept throwing it. And so far, I wish you could have seen it. And I just let her talk. And it, it was just tough. I don't think the people can ever be the same. So much of that. And they were treated so badly by our government and so badly by, by this man, this man that doesn't have even a clue. He's looking at his watch. The bodies are coming in. He's going, huh, huh. He doesn't know what the hell it says anyway, huh? <laughs> it was so, so horrible to see the whole thing. But in addition to Governor Nome, we're pleased to be joined tonight by her wonderful husband, Brian, and her mother, Corin, who I met, uh, who is fantastic. Now I know how this all happened. Could you please stand up, please? Corin, Brian, thank you. You think it's easy being with her, huh? It's not easy. They're incredible. Two incredible people. I've gotten to know them. Lieutenant Governor Larry Roden has been uh, terrific. Really terrific. Wherever he may be. Thank you, Larry. Attorney General Marty Jackley. Attorney General. Thank you. Great job you're doing. Great job. Treasurer Josh Hader. Josh, thank you, Josh. Fantastic. Auditor, that's what the United States could use a good auditor like Rich Satgast. The country could. Did you know they said 
billions of dollars to Afghanistan. Nobody has any idea where the money is. Rich, that wouldn't happen with you, right? He'd know every penny. I don't know, maybe not every penny, but think of it. We've put in $200 billion. And Europe, which is approximately the same size economy if you add it up, but which is obviously much more affected by that whole situation, would have never happened, by the way. Zero chance it would have happened. Zero. Would have never happened. And I'll get it done, too. I'll get it negotiated done. But it would have been a lot easier. All those dead people, all those cities that are in ruins, just in ruins. But when you look at that and you look at what happened, this is something that should have never, ever happened. But Europe is in for $20 billion. We're in for $200 billion. Why? It was like that with NATO. I said, you're not paying your bills. The United States was paying close to 100 percent of NATO. So they screw us on trade, and then we have to protect them militarily. I said, that doesn't work. And I got them to put up hundreds of billions of dollars in one meeting. They said to me, does that mean, sir, that you're not going to defend us from Russia if we're not paid up? I said, did you pay? No, I didn't. That means you're not going to be defended. And the money came pouring in. It was an amazing thing. <laughs> hundreds of billions of dollars. That's why NATO has money to to do this. But think of it, they're in for $20 billion, we're in for $200 billion. Why? Why aren't they the same? First call I'd make is NATO. You've got to equalize. You've got to equalize. You've got to put up money. But they're dealing with stupid people, our leaders. They're dealing with stupid people. Why should France and Germany, and why should all of them put up money if we don't ask them to put it up? Nobody asks. It was like with NATO. Nobody. Bush never asked. Obama never asked. He'd go and make a speech, leave, and that's it. We'd pay all the costs. And nobody's asking. I don't, do you think Biden goes there? You know, you've got to equalize. This is not right. I don't think so. I don't think he knows what the hell we're even talking about, if I told him. But we have to, we have to get them to put up money. They have to put up money because they have a lot of money. But why should they put it up if we're doing it? We sent $25 billion yesterday, and somebody said, it's a lot of money. By the way, $25 billion, that's a lot of money. It was just like on a fluke. Blinken or somebody went there and he said, oh, we're going to give you another 25. 25 billion, that's more than Europe has put up. But we have to be able, we have to be respected again. They don't respect us at all. You know, they respected me and I was tough on them with all the money I took in from countries, but in particular China. But they actually do better. You can be tough and you'll do better with them. They never treated us and me the way they treat this administration, they treat them like they're lapdogs. They, they call up, <laughs> she said they are. Who said that? Stand up, please. Will you stand up? Who said that? Somebody, boy. Well, you're right about that. They have to respect you. School and Public Lands Commissioner, Brock Greenfield. Brock, thank you. Is China buying any of that land, Brock? Uh, no, he says, no, sir. Public Utilities Commissioner Christy Feigen. Thank you, Christy. Great job. A very special guy. This guy is tough. I mean, he's, he's great. He broke every record tonight. He never thought I'd see a thing like this happen. Because it's true. What Christy said, a lot of the people turned it down. I don't turn down. I come back to the people that love me. I come back. They turned it down. And if they did come, you'd have a crowd of about 100 people. But he knew what he was doing. He went to Christie. He said, do you think you can get Trump? And they called me, and I said, let's do it. Let's break every damn record for South Dakota. He's your GOP chairman, John Wick. And he's doing a fantastic job. John, great job. Great job. Thank you very much, John. A man who's also doing something very special, Rapid City Mayor Jason Solomon. Jason. Thank you, Jason. A friend of mine and one of the most respected people in the Senate. He's a great guy, Steve Daines. Where's Steve? Where is Steve? He's doing he is doing some job and he's he's my friend. We need more Steve Daines in the Senate, because the Senate has to get a lot tougher. Steve knows that. they got to get a lot tougher in the Senate. Sad what's happening. 
And a man who was was my first person. He was uh, he's just outstanding. That's all I could say. He said I put him in six months before I ran. This is 2015 now. I said, "What are you thinking?" They were doing polls, and I looked like I was doing well, beating people. And uh, he came in. He said, "Sir, I'm telling you, you're going to win." I said, "Really, you think?" And every day he comes to my office, "Sir, you're leading. You're winning. You're leading. This poll is unbelievable. Look at. It. I don't even know if it was a real poll. He just kept saying, "You're unbelievable, sir. It's the most incredible politician I've ever seen. I haven't even started yet." And he got me a little bit uh, excited. And then I started seeing the country wasn't doing well. And I said, you know what, Corey Lewandowski, I think what we're going to do is we're going to run. And he's a great guy and a very smart guy and a wonderful person and a friend of everybody. Corey Lewandowski. Where is he? Where is he? It's true. Were they real polls, Corey? You better tell me. <laughs> oh, he said no. He said no. That's I have a feeling that it might be true. Thank you, Corey. Great guy. With the help of many of you in this arena, in four short years, we achieved more than any administration in the history of our country. We have to, and I say that all the time. And the fake news doesn't even correct me. We've done so many things. We became energy independent for the first time in history, and soon would have been energy dominant for the first time ever. Making billions and billions of dollars, rapidly paying down our staggering $34 trillion in debt. We're going to pay it down so fast, and reducing your taxes still further. I gave you the largest tax cut in the history of our country. Well, listening to former President Donald Trump make remarks at a Republican rally over in South Dakota. Some of you will be seeing a two-minute break. Nearly 500 miles of border wall got Mexico to give us. 28,000 soldiers. You know, they always say, oh, he didn't get Mexico. I got Mexico to give us free of charge 28,000 soldiers while we were building the wall. We built almost 500 miles. You know what my critics say? Oh, but it wasn't all new. No. If there was an old two by four laying in the ground that's 50 years old, where they would take it and throw it away, would put in a brand new wall, they'd say, that was a renovation. That wasn't new. No. These people are sick. But we built almost. Almost 500 miles. Then we were going to add another 200 miles, and we had it all done. You saw what happened, and would have taken them three weeks to put it up. We had the bad result in the election. Would have taken three weeks, and we would have every hole would have been plugged. And we built the exact wall that the Border Patrol. They're incredible. Brandon Judd is incredible. Tom Holman is incredible. We have incredible people, but. But and they want to do their job. It's you know they could they could sit back and they could just not do anything. They really want to do. They love the country. They want to see it happen. But we got Mexico to put up billions and billions and billions of dollars in 28,000 soldiers protecting our border. We had the best record ever in the history of our country, and that included human trafficking, mostly in women. A horrible thing. You think of it as an ancient. Horrible situation, but it's it was just it's bigger now because of the internet. It's this massive, massive business, much bigger than it was a hundred years ago and two hundred years ago. It's horrible, but we had it to the lowest point it's been in decades, and we had drugs down to the lowest point they've been in decades, and we got Mexico to give us all those soldiers for all those people that say this was much more money than I was going to get Mexico to pay. They gave us twenty-eight thousand feet. Now I did tell them, listen. If you don't do that, we're going to tear off all the cars that come into the United States at a level like has never happened before. We would love to uh, give you 28,000 free soldiers, <laughs> sir. We would love to give you 28,000. You know, when I first told them about that, we need 28,000 soldiers. Your soldiers, free of charge. We need them on the border. And they looked at me like, "Are you kidding?" Then I said, "No, we have to have it. No, we won't do that." I said, "Yes, you will. You will do it. I'm telling you, you will." And we had a person at the State Department, a woman who was great. She was dealing with Mexico for 25 years. Sir, he'll never do it. She, he was very, she was very good, but she was never able to get anything. But she said he won't do it. They won't do that. And I said, Yeah, they will. Then when I met with the representative, the top guy, and I said, uh, Yeah, we want 28,000 soldiers. He said, ha, 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 ha. We're not going to do that. Why would we do it? You're going to do it. You're going to do it. He said, no, we're not. I said, yes, you are. Here's the story. I'm signing this document right now. On Monday morning, this was a Friday night, on Monday morning, 
Everything you send into the United States, we're going to have a tariff on of 25 percent. And that's more money than your 28,000 soldiers will ever cost in a million years. Sir, I'd like to uh, leave this room right now and make a phone call. I'll be back in five minutes. I said, you can do that. He came back. Sir, it would be our great honor to supply you free of charge 28,000 soldiers. And when I was negotiating, I said to the to Brandon Judd and I said to Tom Holman and I said to all of the people that were there that are so great. We had that border so good. It was so all he had to do was go to the beach, okay? Which he does anyway, but he destroyed everything. If he went to the beach, who the hell is telling him to go to the beach every day? Tell me, does he look good? He can't lift. You know, those things weigh about three ounces. They're meant for children to pick up. He can't lift the chair. He can't get his feet out of the sand. It's who the hell, does he have some political consultant say, you know, you've got a great body, you should go to the beach. <laughs> Who the hell has given him that advice? I don't know, does he like the beach that much? So crazy. But we negotiated, very important, remain in Mexico, because they used to come into our country and we couldn't get them out. When they touched our soil, you couldn't get them out. So we said, we want remain in Mexico, Hundreds of thousands of people were in Tijuana and different places. I wouldn't say Mexico was thrilled until we learned who they were. And in many cases, we wouldn't accept them. We wouldn't take them. And Biden gave that up. It was not easy. He gave it up. And we deported illegal alien criminals by the tens of thousands. MS-13. Uh, ICE is so incredible. They don't get the credit. These guys are so tough and love our country so much, they would walk into a nest. They call it a nest of MS-13. These are killers. These are the toughest. This is the toughest gang probably in the world. A lot of them go to Long Island. They go to different places, but Long Island for whatever reason. And we have thousands of them. We got rid of thousands. But these guys would walk into a nest and you just see fists flying. I mean, it's the most incredible thing. Who the hell wants to do it? See that guy there with the black? You're a stand up, please. You're a tough guy. You're not going to do that job. Right? Oh, he voted for Trump. I like him. I knew he's got a thing. I, and I vote for you, too. But you wouldn't do that job. I wouldn't do the job either. But these are tough people. And they love our country. And they were taking them out. They used to call it a paddy wagon. They were throwing them in and they were taking them out by the thousands out of our country. And we had a problem because these other countries like uh, El Salvador, all of these different countries, they wouldn't take. Guatemala. They wouldn't take the people back. And they came to me and they said, Sir, uh, Guatemala, El Salvador, they won't take them back. They never have. They've never agreed to do it. And President Obama was never able to get them back. I said, Oh, how much do we give them in aid a year? Sir, we give them 75 million. I said, I think you're wrong. I think it's 10 times that amount. Sir, I'd like to check. He comes back. Sir, you were right. It's 750 million. I say, well, that's peanuts compared to some what we do, but it's a lot of money. So I said, inform them that effective immediately, we're not making any economic development payments to the country. Because what they would do is we would load up a plane, we would load up a bus, we'd take it into their country and they wouldn't allow it in. They put planes on the runway so our planes would fly in. They, could, they had big planes put all over the runway so our planes couldn't land, so they'd come back. This went on for years. And I said, uh, okay, what you do is we're not going to give them any more money. The 750 informed them effective immediately, no more money. The following morning, I got a call from the three presidents. Sir, we'd like to talk to you. Actually, there were separate calls, too, but the exact same words. Sir, I understand there's some difficulty with bringing people back to our country. I said, yeah, for about 10 years, you haven't allowed anybody back in. You send them out yourself in the caravans but you don't take them back. He goes, uh, sir, uh, perhaps there's a misunderstanding. Uh, we would be honored to take them back. Sir, when will the uh, money start coming back into it? I said, number one, you got to take them back. We brought them back into those countries by the thousands and thousands and thousands. Some of these MS-13s, you read the story, in Long Island. In Long Island, Two beautiful young girls, 16 years old, were walking to school and they attacked them and they cut them up in pieces, little pieces, little pieces. They killed them both. 
And uh, they used knives, not guns, because a knife is much more uh, painful. They watched these kids suffer. These were beautiful, perfect kids. Number one in her class, and the other was fantastic uh, athlete. They cut them up in pieces. These are animals. I said that publicly. I said, these are animals. And Nancy Pelosi said, these are human beings. They're not animals. No, they're animals. And we got them out by the tens of thousands. Now they're pouring back into our country because we have stupid people running our country. We appointed over 300 federal judges and three great Supreme Court justices. And I'll, I'm going to tell you something, because it's really a positive. It's a big positive, but they try and play it as a negative. Last year, those justices bravely and incredibly ruled on something that everybody has wanted for decades, for 51 years. They ruled to end Roe v. Wade. That was a big thing. You're listening to former President Donald Trump make remarks at a GOP rally over in South Dakota. Some of you will be seeing a two-minute break. And it's probably cost us politically because the other side got energized. And, you know, they're the radicals, not the pro-lifers. But now pro-lifers have a tremendous power to negotiate. They have a power. You had no power to negotiate because with Roe v. Wade, you couldn't negotiate. They could do anything they wanted. We didn't have any of that before this ruling. This moves the issue back to the states where every legal scholar said it should be. And like President Ronald Reagan, good man, but like Ronald Reagan before me, I support the three exceptions for rape, incest, and life of the mother. I support. Not everybody does. I think a large portion do. I think you should, but again, that's your own, that's your own feeling. Remember, the Democrats are the radicals on this issue because they're willing to kill babies in their fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth month, and even after birth. They're willing to kill babies. So when politicians talk about this, they have to say that they're the extremists. Because if you're willing to take a baby out of the womb in the eighth month or the ninth month or after the baby's born, remember that crazy governor, the past governor from Virginia, where he said, when the baby's born, you make a decision. And just uh, recently with the Supreme Court, so that, by the way, the pro-life question, uh, it's going to get you in a position where a lot of tremendously good things are going to happen. 52 years they tried to get that out. We did it. And now you're going to be in a position to do what everybody knows is right. And it's a very important, very important decision. Nobody thought it would be possible to get, but it's something that's very important. The Supreme Court also approved something that nobody thought would, they would ever see, merit-based systems of education. In other words, if somebody is going to college and has all A's and wants to apply, all A's, the best of everything, works so hard and gets rejected by somebody that didn't have anywhere near the academic credentials. Nobody thought that would ever get approved. And that was so important. That was such a big thing. It's called merit-based. We have to go back to a merit-based country. But that was just the beginning. Here's just some of the agenda. I'll be immediately implementing when we, it's all of us, when we become 47th President of the United States of America. Before I even arrive at the Oval Office, shortly after I win the presidency, I will have the horrible war between Russia and Ukraine settled. He would have never done it. I know them both. You got it say. When I was on CNN, I told, I said, I want to see the, whose side are you on? I said, I'm on the side of people not being killed. I'm on the side of hundreds of thousands of people are dying. And I think that's going to be one of the bad things uh, later on when you find out the real number of people dying in that war. You know, they'll knock down a city, they'll knock down a apartment house, they'll say two people were injured. They weren't injured. There were hundreds and hundreds of people killed. Those buildings don't come down and you have two people injured. Big buildings coming down, or buildings that are a thousand years old with the golden domes. You can never do that. But much more importantly, the people, so many people, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, it'll be millions. It's already millions. 
And it's a very, very sad thing. And the numbers are far bigger than anyone understands. And I'll get that done. I'm the only candidate who can make this promise. I will prevent World War III. I will prevent it. Nobody else is going to prevent it. Nobody else is going to prevent it. And this will be a war like no other. This is a nuclear war. If you have World War III, it'll be a nuclear war. And uh, this won't be army tanks going back and forth shooting at each other. This will be levels of destruction that nobody's ever contemplated or thought of before. I will totally obliterate the deep state. We started that. We were doing so well. And then COVID came in. And we'll fire the corrupt bureaucrats who have weaponized our justice system and destroying our country to stop the Marxist prosecutors who release rapists and murderers while persecuting Republicans, conservatives, people of faith. I will direct a completely overhauled DOJ to investigate every radical DA and AG in America for their illegal, racist, and reverse enforcement of the law. I will immediately terminate every open borders policy of the Biden administration. We will seal up our borders like they were when they took office. Week after week, we're watching as Joe Biden's deadly border betrayals take precious innocent lives. In May, a pack of five adult illegal alien and suspected MS-13 animals were arrested in Maryland for brutally murdering a 15-year-old boy and dumping his body in a state park. When the parents saw this, they'll never be the same either. The people that I was with the other night, they'll never be the same. These parents will never be the same. No parent will ever be the same. Just last month, the savage illegal alien who was released into our country by Joe Biden and his crazy, weak, Orders, and there are no orders, was arrested for raping an 11-year-old girl and strangling her to death after she was raped. Shortly before she was murdered, she texted her father that someone was knocking at the door. He arrived home from work and found his daughter's body stuffed in a laundry basket under her bed. These vicious Biden border killings must end, but it's only going to get worse because they're letting people in from prisons, from mental institutions. They're letting some of the worst people in the world in. And I tell you, I've met a lot of your law enforcement tonight. We have the greatest people in the world, law enforcement. They know how to do their job. We have to let them do their job. When I'm reelected, we will immediately commence the largest deportation operation in American history. But we cannot wait until 2025 to begin stopping this horrible invasion. This is like a military invasion. They're killing hundreds of thousands of people between the drugs that are coming in, the people that are coming in, the crime. That's why tonight I'm calling on congressional Republicans to ban Joe Biden from using a single tax dollar, no taxpayer money, to release or resettle illegal aliens into the United States, starting on the government funding deadline of September 30th. We take better care of these people, and many of them are criminals, than we take care of our veterans, our soldiers, and spend a lot more money doing it. You know, in New York, many of them are living in luxury hotels. Luxury hotels, hotels that you wouldn't want to go to because you wouldn't want to pay the price. Luxury hotels, it's not even believable. The time for talk is over. Now is the time for action. And they should immediately defund. Time for action. People are tired of talk. People are tired of talk. I said to our First Lady the other night, you know, this is big stuff. They caught Biden getting 10.2 million dollars. That's peanuts compared to what the other numbers. But the guy said, this is big stuff. She goes, oh, well, all right. I said, what do you mean? Well, nothing will happen. We got to let it happen. And I tell Steve and everybody, you got you to gotta take care of I mean, our country is being 
fleeced and robbed by people that have gotten away with things that nobody should be allowed to. And a lot of the Republicans, and they're great people, and great people just, period, Democrats too, they feel that uh, things should happen to take care of this. When, when she went, oh, that's good, nothing will happen. And a lot of people feel that, right? A lot of people feel that. We can't have that. And I hope that's why Steve and his friends, because he's got some great ones over there, but I hope the Senate gets tough, because the House has been, the House has been working hard, but the Senate under this guy, Mitch McConnell, has been a disaster. And they should immediately defund the DOJ and prosecutors who are trying to take conservatives and Republicans out of political races through indictments and other illegal means. That's what they're doing. You know, if I was in third or fourth place, or if I wasn't running, I'd be living the life of Riley. I wouldn't be here with you tonight, but I'd be living the I'd have nice houses all over the place. I'd be living a beautiful life. They wouldn't indict me. They indicted me because I'm in first place. And I hate to read those good polls to you, because every time I read a good poll, they want to indict me again. <laughs> Maybe I should announce I'm doing horribly. It's horrible. Oh, we'll withdraw right? Their goal is to interfere with elections in order to make it harder for Republicans and conservatives to win. Congressional Republicans should also stop the Biden administration from bringing back COVID mandates, lockdowns, or restrictions of any kind by cutting off the money. And in your state, because of your governor, you're not going to have that problem, but a lot of states do. The radical Democrats are trying hard to restart COVID hysteria. I wonder why. Is there an election coming up by any chance? You know, I saw just the other day for the first time, we're thinking about masks again. With I said, what's going on? Oh, that's right, there's an election coming up. Now these guys, they'll do anything. But we can't comply because it's bad. And just follow your governor, follow your governor. You're listening to former President Donald Trump make remarks in South Dakota at a GOP rally. Some of you will be seeing the final break of this hour. With skyrocketing energy costs. Starting with Biden's preposterous electric vehicle mandate. You know, some people want to drive for more than an hour and a half. Sean Fain, you know who that is? The president, and he's a respected guy, president of the United Auto Workers, cannot even think about allowing all electric cars. They will be made, every one of them in China, and the auto industry in America will cease to exist. And they have to, if they do all electric cars, none of them will be made here. They have all of the minerals, they have all of, every form of material, every form of everything they have. We have a thing called gasoline, and they don't have that, but they have to do something. And you know, what you really want is you want to, some people like an electric car, some people like, you got to have choice. Sci hybrids may be a good, but you got to have choice. They're forcing it. Think of it. California had big blackouts this week, and they had a restriction on electric cars taking any electricity. You believe it? And then they want to go all electric. The whole thing is crazy. There is already a giant eatlot. We call it an eatlot. They don't go far along, are very expensive, and the consumer must be given a choice. The consumer wants choice just like we want school choice. We want choice in what kind of a car we buy. So vote for Trump, and I will stop this madness immediately. I will stop it. And, you know, when you think about it, Mexico and Canada love Biden. They love this idiotic policy. That's so good for them. They won't follow suit. And save Michigan and all of the other auto states, because the American consumer just is not interested in doing this. They're not going to do it. They're all over. It's a glut. They call it an eat glut. But we have to save the American consumer is what we really have to save. I will revoke China's most favored nation status. They have a trade status, most favored, because they say they're a developing country. Well, you know what? We're a developing country, too. We have to redevelop, because our country's gone to hell. And we will ban China from buying up America, including American farmland, which you know something about. On day one, 
I will sign a new executive order to cut federal funding for any school pushing critical race theory, transgender insanity, and other inappropriate racial, sexual, or political content on our children. And I will keep men out of women's sports. I will sign a law prohibiting child sexual mutilation in all 50 states. Now, think of it. Could you imagine 10 or 15 years ago having some politician — hate to use that term, but I guess that's what I became — never really wanted to be a politician, but that's what I became, I guess. But could you imagine saying, I will stop child mutilation? Who would think of this? Child mutilation without parental consent. Can you imagine if you made that statement 10 years ago that say, is this guy crazy? But that's what you have to do. We'll stop child mutilation. And can you imagine having to say that I will also restore — we are going to restore the Trump ban on transgender in the military. We had a ban on transgender because And I went to generals. I say, what do you want to do? No, sir, please do, do it, do it, do it. But then you see the same guys on television. Well, I'd like to — they just uh, — it's very sad. You know, I had a ban. And uh, tremendous amounts of drugs are necessary, a lot of other things. You're not allowed to have drugs in the military, so just there. And I love everybody. I mean, I love everybody, but it's uh, not something that works, as people will tell you, as generals will tell you, as people in the military will tell you. So I had a ban, and immediately they released that ban. And, uh, it's, you know, it's not a good situation. Just as I did for four years, I will fully uphold the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment is under siege. And I will secure our elections. Our goal will be one day voting with paper ballots and voter ID. That's all we should have. But until then, you got to get out and vote. The way we win is to swamp them. They can only cheat so much. And, you know, a lot of people say, oh, vote early, you know, go vote early, vote Tuesday. You know, they had a vote in Arizona where many of the machines were broken, the Republican machines, of course, for Carrie Lake, who's a wonderful woman. But they had a vote. And uh, they got there on Tuesday, and they stood in line for hours and hours and hours because a big percentage of the machines were not — not working. A uh, terrible thing. This is what we must do to restore our country to greatness. Together, we are taking on some of the most menacing forces and vicious opponents our people have ever seen. We've never seen anything like it. But no matter how hateful and corrupt the communists and criminals we're fighting against may be, you must never forget that this nation does not belong to them. This nation belongs to you. It belongs to you. This is your home. This is your heritage. And our American liberty is your God-given right. We can't let anybody take it away. From Sioux Falls to Rapid City, from the Black Hills to the Badlands — rather, the Badlands. Explain those Badlands. That's a hell of a name. To, I live in the Badlands. Actually, the inner cities are the Badlands, right? I'll bet your Badlands are very nice. And from the open skies of the Great Plains to the majestic banks of the wide and beautiful Missouri, you stand on the shoulders of some of the toughest, freest, and fiercest people ever to walk on this earth, like her, like him, like so many. This state was built by strong South Dakota men and proud South Dakota women who braved the snow and the rain and the hot and the cold, the dangers and the diseases to head west and settle their families on the great frontier. Life was hard and it was tough, but they were Americans, and this was, to them, God's country. I fully understand it. Fully understand it. This is God's country. South Dakota is the state where Lewis and Clark discovered the awesome splendor of 
the American West. It's where fearless American workers carve their heroes into the face of Mount Rushmore. Think of that. It's where generations of hunters and trappers, cowboys, ranchers, miners, farmers, workers, and craftsmen help build America into the greatest nation in the history of the world. But now, we are a nation in decline. We are a failing nation. We are a nation that has the highest inflation in 50 years, where banks are collapsing and interest rates are through the roof. Likewise, we are a nation where energy costs have reached the highest in our history, where we are no longer energy independent, or energy dominant as we were just a short number of years ago. We are a nation that is begging Venezuela and others for oil. Please, please, please help us, Joe Biden says. Yet we have more liquid gold right under our feet than any other country in the world. We are a nation that just yesterday heard that Saudi Arabia and Russia will be reducing their output of oil and substantially increasing the price. And we met that threat by announcing that we no longer will be drilling for oil in large areas of Alaska. We are a nation that is consumed by the radical left's Green New Deal. Yet everyone knows that the Green New Deal is fake and will lead to our country's destruction. We are a nation whose leaders are demanding all-electric cars, despite the fact that they can't go far, cost too much, and whose batteries are produced in China with materials only available in China when an unlimited amount of gasoline is available inexpensively in the United States, but not available in China. And now we are a nation that wants to make our great army tanks all electric so that despite the fact that they will not be able to go very far either, few pollutants will be released into the air as we blast our way through enemy territory. And also, we are a nation who wants to make our jet fighters with a green energy stamp, losing 15% efficiency, but allowing us to keep our enemy's atmosphere clean of pollutants while we attempt to knock out their planes all over the skies. We are a nation that ended oil exploration and production in the U.S. just as the price of oil reached an all-time high. What other country would do such a thing as that? We are a nation that surrendered in Afghanistan, leaving behind dead soldiers, American citizens, and $85 billion worth of the finest military equipment in the world. And we are a nation that allowed Russia to devastate a country, Ukraine, killing hundreds of thousands of people. And it will only get worse. It would never have happened with me as your president. And for four straight years, it didn't happen. And China with Taiwan is next. We were a nation that has weaponized its law enforcement against the opposing political party like never seen before. We've got a Federal Bureau of Investigation that won't allow bad election-changing facts to be presented to the public and which offers $1 million to a writer of fiction about Donald Trump to lie and say it was fact 
where Hunter Biden's laptop from hell was Russian disinformation, and the FBI knew it wasn't, but 51 intelligence agents said it was, and they knew it wasn't also, and the Department of Justice that refuses to investigate egregious acts of voting irregularities and fraud, and we have a man who is totally corrupt and the worst president in the history of our country who is cognitively impaired, in no condition to lead, and is now in charge of dealing with Russia and the possibility of nuclear war, which would be World War III and far more devastating than any of the previous world wars because of the weaponry that no one even wants to think about most powerful weapons in history. We are a nation that no longer has a free and fair press. Fake news is all you get, and they are the enemy of the people. They refuse to discuss the Biden crime family, but enjoy covering false indictments of Donald Trump, who has done nothing wrong. We are a nation where free speech is no longer allowed and where crime is rampant and out of control like never before. We are a nation that is allowing Iran to build a massive nuclear weapon and China to use the trillions and trillions of dollars it has taken from us to build a military to more than rival our own. And less than three years ago, we had Iran, China, Russia, and North Korea in check. They weren't going to do a thing against us, and everyone knows it. They respected us greatly. Now Russia and China are holding summits to carve up the world, and perhaps most importantly, we are a nation that is no longer respected or listened to on the world stage. No respect. They think we're run by fools. We are a nation that in many ways has become a joke. And we are a nation that is hostile to liberty, freedom, and faith. We are a nation whose economy is collapsing into a cesspool of ruin, whose supply chain, this horrible, horrible supply chain, is broken and whose stores are not stocked, whose deliveries are not coming, and whose educational system is ranked at the bottom of every single list. We are a nation where large packs of sadistic criminals and thieves are allowed to go into stores and openly rob them, beat up and kill their workers and customers, and leave with armloads of goods, but with no retribution, where the authority of our great police has been taken, where their families and pensions have been threatened, and their lives would be destroyed for the mere mention of the words law enforcement. We are a nation where fentanyl and all other forms of illegal drugs are easier to get than formula for our beautiful little babies. A nation whose once revered airports are a dirty, crowded mess. You sit and wait for hours and then are notified that the plane won't leave, and they have no idea when they will, where their ticket prices have tripled, they don't have the pilots to fly the planes, they don't seek qualified air traffic controllers, and they just don't know what they're doing. We are a nation that has lost its confidence, it's lost its willpower, and it's lost its strength. We are a nation that has, quite simply, lost its way. But we are not going to allow this horror to continue. Three years ago, we were a great nation, and we will soon be a great nation again. It was hardworking patriots like you who built this country. And it is hardworking patriots like you who are going to save our country. 2024 is our final battle. With your support in this primary, we are going to finish 
what we so brilliantly started. With you at my side, we will demolish the deep state. We will drive out the globalists. We will cast out the communists. We will throw off the sick political class that hates our country. We will rout the fake news media, and we will drain the swamp once and for all. Like those patriots before us, we will not bend, we will not break, we will not yield, we will never give in, we will never give up, and we will never, ever back down. Together, we will complete the mission, we will cross the finish line, we will evict crooked Joe Biden from the White House, and we will take back this country with a righteous and magnificent victory on Election Day 2024. The great silent majority is rising like never before. And under our leadership, the forgotten men and women will be forgotten no longer. We are one movement, one people, one family, and one glorious nation under God. And together we will make America powerful again. We will make America wealthy again. We will make America strong again. We will make America proud again. We will make America safe again. And we will make America great again. Thank you. Thank you, South Dakota. God bless you. God bless you all. Thank you. You just heard former President Donald Trump there speaking to quite a lovely and large crowd in South Dakota. He was preceded by the governor in South Dakota, Christine Noem, and the president there giving that speech for uh, more than an hour now, as you can see supporters behind him holding up Trump 2024 signs. And we also saw some signs that said Trump Noem 2024. And this is the first time that we've heard the former president speak to a large crowd like this since that indictment in Georgia. He has said that he is not going to be participating in any of the GOP primary debates. And that's in part because of all the investigations surrounding him. But he says that it's because he's leading very much in the polls against the other GOP presidential candidates that he doesn't feel the need to participate in those debates.